it's so good to see your faces. Um, you know, today, as um, Alicia has said, we have Emily Weiss and Joe Solinsky, who are from the Etzel and Eleanor Ford House. Um, Emily is uh, their Educations Program Coordinator, and Joe is a certified arborist at the Ford House. And they're also both members of the Ford House Sustainability Committee there. Um, like we are really excited that they are here with us today because in early May, Alicia and I uh, participated in the Ford House Victory Gardens virtual workshop and we enjoyed it so much. You know, I asked if they could present this to you and we were so happy that they said yes. So here we are. Um, their workshop did inspire me to make a small victory garden of uh, basil, rosemary, and um, some dahlias in a little container. And it's added some really a lot of happiness to my backyard Zen place uh, where I've been trying to spend more time during this COVID time. Um, I hope next year to do a little more planting, but I'm happy with my start and my basil is going bonkers and mm -hmm. there's a lot of pesto happening. Yeah, so I just want to say that. So I am just so happy that you're here and that everyone can share in this experience. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Emily and Joe, to keep the inspiration going. So it's all well, that's so nice to hear. I'm glad. Um, I have some tomato plants. Oh, okay. uh, I think Joe directly inspired, although he doesn't like to eat tomatoes. No. <laughs> <laughs> like I can't get over it. I don't know how you don't like tomatoes. They're so good. All right. So we are both employees of the Ford House. For you guys that don't know, um, we Ford House is a historic house museum, the home of Eleanor and Etzel Ford. We are also a National Historic Landmark, designated for our breathtaking 87 acres that were designed by Jen Jensen. Um, he designed this during a big conservation progressive era movement that really highlighted the use of native plants and plantings. Out of this movement, we got a lot of our national parks in the same era. Um, we got, you know, uh, uh, Central Park in uh, New York City came out of the conservationist progressive era, also Belle Isle. And we used to have a lot of good highlights of Michigan native plants um, on our property. So we are open to members for ground walks right now. And I think we're gonna expand it, you know, knock on wood pretty soon. But here, we're here to talk about Victory Gardens. And the role historically, we're also gonna talk about um, how it was locally, how it helped us um, during our World War I, World War II eras, what the third wave looks like. And uh, we're also gonna talk about, mostly uh, James Joe, is gonna talk about how um, to start your own, even though, we're midsummer. I think Joe says a lot in these garden workshops that we've been doing. It's never too late. Just go up there and start and start a garden anytime. Um, there's a lot of, of playing around with gardening that um, Joe has taught me. It seems very rigid, but uh, I think Joe, you can say there's there's a fair amount of just trying things out in gardening. It's a good time for that. So we'll start with the history, and I love this picture right here. We because we work, it's so stark. But uh, first one, we will, uh, Victory Garden started in World War One which is not something we typically associate, we associate with the World War II era of Victory Gardens, but starting from World War I, um, any available space will do. We have the front yards, backyards, schoolyard gardens became very, very popular. It joined with that progressive era of conservationist movement that I talked about Jim Jensen, um, valuing very high. And we have the schoolyard gardens. Um, it's also during a time that we really started emphasizing, one, the role of actively parenting and, and you know, parenting and raising our children, and then also when we start to really emphasize uh, children's need to play outdoor. It hit its peak, Victory Gardens, in World War II, which is something we uh, associate a little more. A lot of first-time gardeners, since we have a lot of people moving um, during the industrialist movement from farm work to labor inside the cities and industrial uh, work, so we have people kind of lost connection with the land a little bit. We see them coming back with these World War II Victory Gardens, the peak in, of the movement. We see the United States, the United Kingdom, and Australia, which was a kind of surprising one to me. They're popular in Michigan because we're a great ag uh, agricultural state. We have very rich, fertile soil. We're really a land of abundance. We have our fresh water. We're a great state to grow in. And especially popular with the Fairy Seed Company. Now, those of you guys that are familiar with the DIA or Detroit, you know, Fairy Street. That's named after um, Fairy Seeds. It's one of the uh, first companies to sell these smaller packets. 
we're moving away from large farms to more individual, um, you know, the turn of the century, small plots on rooftops in schoolyards. We have these small packets that we're kind of familiar with now. They were the largest producer of seeds. Um, and he is a huge contributor to what we now is, know as the DIA, the Detroit Institute of Arts. Um, a lot of his funding directly funded the DIA, and those of you familiar with the Fords, Eleanor and Essel were also large funders of those. We do like the DIA. His original factory did burn down, but they came back stronger and was a very profitable seed company uh, and helped uh, with the economy of Detroit at the time. We're talking about early um, 20th century. And one of the best part about Victory Gardens is definitely the propaganda posters. I mean, they're gorgeous. They're really interesting. We see this is actually a seed packet from this fairy seed co uh, company. They're just beautiful brushworks, really romantic, great use of the lighting. We also see Victory Gardens in Gross Point from our Gross Point wartime history, um, where they are still democracy, but we're also producing a lot of um, food and, and things. And we see that in Jail Hudson. So those of you who aren't familiar or don't remember, we used to have Hudson's big department store. Eleanor Ford is actually the niece of Jail Hudson and lived with him um, during when she was growing up. And they had a large display, as you can see here, of not what you do, but everything that you do can, that kind of pitching in that help. We need more food. Our supply lines are getting disrupted by World War II. And the Detroit Garden Club, uh, which existed in, um, and still exists to this day, was one of the third in the nations to really start this victory garden movement. Um, they had the met at the Society for Arts and Crafts, which is now known as CCS, which has another great, we love our four connections. Um, Eleanor and Natsel are big contributors uh, to that. They're in the house in the DIA. Um, they really worked to get that movement going in Detroit. And Fort House, Joe, you want to tell us about that? So in this photo that you see here on the left, obviously we got a little garden. Um, long, uh, the family liked to teach the idea of understanding where your food came from. Um, they were the richest family in the world at the time, but at the same time they wanted you to know your roots. And one of the ways that they did that was creating their own victory garden. And they had done that and the, uh, I believe it was the mid to late uh, or late 40s, uh, just outside of the playhouse, which is the building you see here. Obviously, in the one photo, it's very uh, prominent. You can see those little stick, tiny trees that you see standing up in the corners are what we are called columnar apple trees, and they were pruned so the apples would only fruit on that single stem and not branch out. And then in the other photo, just in, in between the shrub in the building, you see just a tiny little shot of this garden. And these are the only two photos known in existence of this garden that we can find in our archives. And those of you who haven't been to this state, um, this is Josephine's Playhouse. It's a three fourths uh, scale model of a home, um, quite an elaborate playhouse. Uh, but it is nice that they really wanted their children, even though they are different reference base for a lot of people at the time to know where food came from and really support victory garden for them was less about food production for the family and more about knowing where you came from and knowing what that agriculture really means so the results so it was a very successful program victory gardens at the peak that's 40 percent of food production which is kind of baffling to think about today um but it's more than just actually producing food it's also helped boost morale you have steak in World War II, there's a lot of things, I think it's a really relatable thing um, now with everything going on, is you kind of have a lot of things out of your control, but you can control your actions and what you do and how you contribute. We have a lot of um, social morale being boosted by these victory gardens. They're also paired, um, I have some uh, old knitting patterns, people were knitting for the troops, people were gathering pins, paired with that kind of action in your front door. Although it was great, I wish we kept with it. Uh, unfortunately, in the 50s, we have suburban, or fortunately, unfortunately, when in the 50s, we have suburban growth, so they traded in their victory gardens for these lawns. Although we are seeing a surge of now trading in lawns for no mows and no lawns and using that as pollinator habitats, it's something we kind of sway our pendulum quite a bit as a society. And we have our third rave. So, this is not as defined as it's pretty recent, 
uh, we see a support of sustainability and a retention of the earth. Um, Detroit's a big city for green infrastructure. We've seen a lot of gardens popping up in the past couple of years. Here's one really close to Ferry Street, actually, um, from MSU. They have a large spot an acre of community gardens. Um, in COVID-19, a very early um, stages, which feels like forever ago, but I guess it was only a couple months ago. Um, we saw two or three times demand and seeds in March and April. It's interesting to watch the April specific times. We see a lot of dry demand and seeds um, for the home garden there. Um, and then early May, a uh, victory garden was planted at Detroit Bloom, um, which is right on the border at by um, Alter Road. So starting your own, which inspire you. Joe, do you want to take it away? Yeah, sure. I'll take it from here. So yes, anybody, you know, as we said earlier, gardening, you can do that all four seasons. Winter, obviously the toughest, but we're now finding ourselves in the summer season and it's, a, it's still a great time to uh, start a garden. So what type of garden is best for you? Are you an indoor gardener, an outdoor gardener? You want to do raised beds or plant directly into the earth? Maybe you're living in an apartment or a townhouse that you have, are stuck with a uh, patio or a balcony, still there's options for you. Um, what site do you have to grow in? Uh, what are your light conditions and the type of access? Um, you know, how hard is it to get water to your plants? How many plants do you want to take care of? Are you, you know, limited in your own mobility? These are all things to consider. And then um, picking seeds to sow for your specific summer or spring um, crops, your specific summer crops and your specific fall crops. So um, we'll go through all of them and I'll touch upon which ones are gonna be good for uh, specifically summer that you can look at starting right now as well. So starting with seed selection, um, choose seeds based on wherever your garden will go. Um, you'll find more on that later. Uh, choose seeds based on your light levels. Um, what do you enjoy eating? You, maybe. You know, you're like me, you like growing certain things, but you don't like eating them and your family members do. So uh, you can grow more. Uh, are you going to grow for somebody that maybe is elderly and has uh, mobility issues as well? And, you know, you can get a list of items that they would want to eat and you can grow for them. Seasonal timings, um, just understanding that certain vegetables don't take uh, 120 days to come to, uh, maturity so understanding when to uh, plant and when to replant certain things and then what skill level do you want to attack this with are you beginner are you moderate are you advanced and there's a garden for each and every one of us I do want to point out just I, I am I can see behind me I literally have a propaganda poster I love these artworks and this is another one from the fairy seed Detroit um, company the actual seed bag mm -hmm. I, I, love, I just love, I think they're just so pretty. Yeah, they are. So uh, where do you buy? You know, there's so many options from the major uh, competitors, like the big box stores to uh, like Burpee and stuff like that. But I like to stay away from a lot of the larger names. You know, it's not, uh, you, sometimes you got to rely on that stuff, but I like to support a lot of local family owned things. Um, some local ones are the Ann Arbor Seed Company, obviously based in Ann Arbor, and the and Nature and Nurture Seeds, which is based out of Detroit. Um, both good options, slightly limited in their selection, but they do have a lot of locally grown, locally harvested um, organic seeds that you can choose from. Um, some online resources are Seed Savers Exchange, a very, very popular one, Baker Creek uh, Seed Company, and another more popular one, Botanical Interests. Of the three or of the five on the screen, my favorite is the online store Seed Savers Exchange. With each one of those seeds um, in the catalog and online, you kind of get a backstory about where that seed came from, and you can essentially trace the lineage of, um, say, a sweet potato that you buy on their website, and it gives you the backstory on where that sweet potato came from. Essentially, putting it into an era before genetically modified crops were an actual thing. And um, it essentially protects you from having to worry about any of that type of stuff because it's been grown in the same family for like 10 generations or six generations or something like that. So it's just kind of uh, cool to learn the history of your seeds 
and to know that they're clean of any type of contaminants. So more on seeds. Uh, store your seeds in an airtight container or in paper envelopes. Baby food containers, uh, mason jars, and paper envelopes work well. You want to limit the amount of moisture that the seeds are exposed to because um, limiting or exposing them to too much moisture can actually ruin your seeds. Use splits from your friends, uh, family, and neighbors. So for like perennial vegetables, like horseradish, asparagus, rhubarb, um, some of the different berries and stuff like that. You know, if they got a big patch or your cousin or daughter or uncle or somebody's got a big patch, they'd love to share it with you. I can almost guarantee it. Uh, you can gather seeds from uh, flowering vegetable plants. So you want to know uh, what a split is? Yeah, split, and you know, this happens a lot in, in landscapes when perennials get overgrown, essentially. And you essentially just take and split your plant. You stick a shovel in the middle of it, cut it in half, and you split it. So because it'll, it's becoming a little too overgrown, and this is just a propagation method with uh, essentially things that are clump forming by roots. And like anybody that knows these three plants, horseradish, asparagus, and rhubarb are extremely root heavy plants and they're hard to dig up. But what that does is most of the energy for the plant is in the root. So you can dig that root up and, you know, bring it to your house and start your own patch. Similar to the seed savers exchange, you know, you're growing your grandma's rhubarb or your, your great uncle's asparagus. And it's kind of cool to just keep it in the family. Like I know some people who, are from Finland and own a piece of property up in the UP that's been in their family since the late 1700s and they've been growing potatoes on that exact patch of land since their um, relatives bought it in the late 1700s and those mm -hmm. potatoes to this day are the exact uh, lineage of the potatoes that their um, great ancestors grew on that very land so it's kind of fun you can do a lot yeah. It's like a legacy. It's really cool to have that. It's, yeah. You can start it now in a hundred years from now, we can say. Yeah, so yeah. much. Um, Way back in 2020. <laughs> yeah, you know, you can use your seeds from friends, families, and neighbors, you know. There's so, you, everybody knows a gardener, and um, they're always uh, willing. So exchange, grow things for each other, and give seeds during winter or, you know, special occasions and stuff like that. Or a little, you know, whatever party you can, you can just do all kinds of fun things with them. Yeah. So the seeds for spring and fall, I picked spring and fall mainly because they're similar in uh, temperature. Spring starts off cool, uh, fall starts off a little warmer, but all in all, it's about the same average temperature in the day. Good things to plant are everything you see here: broccoli, cabbage, spring radishes, your charred beans. Basil, we heard about earlier, is already exploding, and it's just now uh, July. Thyme, which is a good one. Um, we're going to be doing another class in August about replacing your lawn, and a flowering thyme lawn is a really cool option. So we'll that talk. Smells about, really good. Yeah, it's going to be fun. You can walk all over it, and you you know it just smells herby and cool. Uh, parsley and are a good one because they are so expensive when you buy them individually, and then you buy them, you get this packaged ones it's a lot of packaging but they are really easy to grow i mean if, if i can grow it anyway. yeah it's more fun to grab, reach into your cupboard and get out a shaker of your own homegrown oregano than it mm -hmm. is to get one from mccormick or something like that you know? <laughs> so yeah i mean everything you see on here is great for spring and fall and then um, a lot of these are very short season crops like your beets your peas your carrots spinach lettuces you know a lot of the greens and that type of stuff um, should be sown every few weeks. And I emphasize a lot to make sure you familiarize, familiarize yourself with the back of your seed packets. Wherever that information is on your seed packet, memorize that because it tells you everything from depth to height to spacing to thinning to you know um, successive uh, sowings. So you just know. Um, all the information on the back of those packets or inside of those packets will lead you to success. I've asked the garden, uh, our landscape crew a lot of questions. Um, and it always, every, across the board, they always say, read the instructions. Yeah. Read the instructions, read the instructions, read the instructions. Or oh, oh, just tell you to Google it. <laughs> That's one too. What is, I see kohlrabi on here. What is that? 
So kohlrabi is an Asian vegetable. It's kind of like um, a water chestnut that's about the size of a you know a grapefruit, and it was actually brought to popularity in the um, Victory Garden times because it was an international crop that grew a ton of seeds, and it was easy to um, grow. It's uh, drought tolerant, and it doesn't have a lot of enemies besides um, like cabbage moth and things like that. But it was easy to care for back in the uh, Victory Garden days. So um, you saw that one become more and more popular. So a few years ago when we installed our Victory Garden, we grew kohlrabi on the uh, estate just to test it out. It was the first time we'd ever tried it. And uh, it was a very cool vegetable. We've had mixed um, um, feedback as far as, you know, how much people liked it. Some people said it was really good. Some people said it was great baked with some salt, pepper, and olive oil on it. Some people said it was terrible. So, uh, <laughs> you know, there's a, a mix of uh, opinions for sure. I'm trying. So, yeah, now here we are, summer. So your seeds for summer, your zucchinis, your sweet potatoes, to uh, tomatillos, um, eggplant, corn, melons, peppers. This is when you want to look at doing another sowing of your uh, bean plants and your cucumbers stuff like that um, you want to get uh, look out for your summer vegetables because if you choose a variety certain varieties are quick fruiting so most corns are 120 day crops that's kind of imperative that you get that one in early just after last frost and then you know it's harvestable sometime in late or early or late September early October and eggplant can be another one like that as well if you want to stick to something around 90 days and they have options for those out there you can find them on the internet so um, yeah along with your second sowings you want to make sure and uh, um, sow your other vegetables like your uh, lettuces and your peas and spinach during the summer you want to use something called a row cover which is essentially you know I know a lot of people in this industry that have interest in this stuff are crafty as well and you can create these row covers out of coat hangers and like an old sheet and stuff like that. Um, you can research them online. You can buy them online. You can find do-it-yourself plans online. But it's just something to stop the that that raw extreme sun from baking down on those uh, t more tender plants. And it creates a cooler environment inside of that little row cover. And it'll allow you to essentially kind of have more spring-like environment in there instead of this um, harsh 80, 90 degree weather that we're, we're having now. You wouldn't need to do that, correct me if I'm wrong, for like the peppers or the corn because those are hot weather plants? Or yeah, is it yeah. You, yeah. Everything else on here appreciates is the full, is just full sun. But anything, full yeah, with the kind of softer leaf like the spinach or the lettuce. Yeah, yep, yep. Those ones actually get sunburned and uh, <laughs> those just wither up and die. Oh, that's so sad. Um, I, I can relate to that. I've been very easy. Um, yeah. So uh, your garden site selection, you know, this is just a random photo that we uh, had. It's used. not a random photo. Joe, well, you just broke my heart. This is from our rain garden that we um, paired up with the University of Liggett Kids and um, the Jefferson Chalmers Youth Committee. And we installed, I don't think you were on this project. So no, I, I did it. But I recognized our wheelbarrow as soon as I said it ran up, and I was like, <laughs> I was I was saving it, but then you cut me off. <laughs> okay, I, I I appreciate you trying to save it. You know, we did a um, our rain garden in that area, um, the Jefferson Chambers neighborhood um, in Detroit, where right where you cross Alter Road, it's a really beautiful neighborhood, but it experiences a lot of flooding um, and a lot of runoff issues. And we uh, designed and planted with these high school uh, age kids this rain garden. And yeah, Joe, you weren't there, I guess. You missed it. It was a lot of fun, to be honest. <laughs> I think I was on a backpacking vacation during that one. So. Oh, that sounds a little more fun. <laughs> so, all right, garden site selection. You can even grow plants in Detroit. Um, <laughs> where do you want your garden to go? Um, obviously, we have options for backyards, front yards, patios, decks, balconies, indoor gardens as well. You can do hydroponics. You can do all kinds of fun stuff. Uh, the space you de de choose determines what you can grow. Obviously, you're not going to be able to grow corn inside. Um, so um, some things, you know, you can do some uh, extreme stuff indoors, but it usually 
costs quite a lot of money to regulate light and wind and, and humidity and all that kind of stuff. So um, just choose the right space. It'll make it easier on you in the long run. Most plants require light and not sun, which is the uh, thing that most people don't understand really. So if you put light, you know, plants in a brighter area that doesn't get direct light, they'll still grow, you know, pretty good. Um, you might not be able to get away with uh, some of your more direct sun loving things like rosemary and stuff like that, but um, you could easily do cucumbers and beans and a lot of the um, spring and fall type vegetables will do good and, and, and not direct light, but just indirect light. So, you know, and light is just reflected sun. It's a, uh, just a little tip that I always like to give out because you can do more than you think with the spaces that you have. And even if you only get a certain amount of sun in the afternoon and a certain amount of sun in the morning, if that space gets a collective amount of sun, you know, light during the day, then you're good to go. Just if it doesn't all happen at once, then it's, uh, um, you can still do more than you think. So some yeah. points, what's that? Oh, my mom, as, as you know, lives out in the country and she's in this tons of trees and for years she's like I can't grow anything out here I can't grow anything out here and this year I was like just try which I regretted because I immediately had to do all the physical <laughs> labor for her but um she actually is finding that she more light goes through the trees than you think and just that getting out there and trying is really really helpful not discrediting yourself yeah <laughs> So like I was saying, you know, most things are do fine in, in, in decent light conditions, but some plants do best in that full sun, like you were asking earlier about peppers and stuff like that. You definitely want to see your melons, peppers, and your squash plants uh, in full sun because they just do better. Um, your beans, your carrots, radishes, and stuff like that, they're fine in high light conditions. Like I was saying, the reflected light and stuff like that. Um, it's the same kind of mentality as growing plants on your windowsill that doesn't get direct sun all day long. It gets a little bit, but not, not full sun. And um, you can do a lot. Uh, a beginner's garden example, you know, start small. You can just have a few plants. You can start lar a little bit larger. So six by six, 10 by, by 10. Um, an easy thing to do for the beginners is to use the square foot garden method, which is exactly what it sounds. You break your garden down into essentially a square foot grid, and then you use those individual little one uh, square foot sections to uh, plant out specific crops. And each crop kind of takes up so much space, you know, like a one single melon plant essentially takes up four square feet in a garden. So it would take up four of your little spaces. And this is all, all this information is available online, you know, a single spot for carrots. You can grow, you know, maybe uh, six or eight carrots in, in a square foot, you know. So it just kind of lets you monitor individually little little amounts of plants for the same specific, uh, like, a vegetable than an entire garden full. Is like, go, you know, we're just going in too heavily for the first time. Or, but a lot of the best beginner plants are, you know, some of your leafy greens and your root veggies and stuff like that. But a lot of the other favorites as well. Uh, so you got radishes and spinach, peas, lettuce, cucumbers, beans, carrots, onions, tomatoes, and chards. And another, you know, don't ever forget to plant uh, stuff that's good for pollinators in your garden as well. So um, the more your stuff is pollinated, the better and better uh, of a yield you'll have in the long run. And um, things that tend to attract um, pollinators, you can tell kind of by looking at them. If they have a flower, especially a fragrant flower, that's going to be good for pollinators. Yeah, don't, you know, and don't get uh, intimidated by it as well. There's many years where uh, I'll just walk outside with a Q-tip and I'll rub it on all the, the, the pepper flowers, you know, and just guaranteeing that I have germination, do the same thing with mm -hmm. uh, corn and do the same thing with... Uh, like uh, cucumbers and stuff like that, you know, like two seconds of just kind of even your fingertip. If you get a little bit of that, that pollen on your fingertip, you can just rub it in there and uh, you can pollinate it. No problem. You guarantee yourself. And this is just, that's, you know, a little example of a, uh, what is that? A four by four and a yeah, two four by four square foot gardens, little raised beds. Those are just two by eights cut, you know, to four feet by four feet. You can put that little lattice thing on the uh, garden bed, but it's not really needed. 
you, you'll know. Uh, and then, then on the right, it's kind of just a cartoon version of what it would look like, um, all drawn up. The plant on the bottom right, number 16, if you can see that one, is nasturtium. That's a flowering, uh, that's a nice flower. It's also it's very edible. The, the uh, leaves are edible. The flowers are edible. So it makes really cool additions to salad. And I like to actually use the um, the leaves on, like, I used to eat burgers and salmon burgers and stuff like that. And I would just take the leaves and set them on there. And it adds a nice, like, interesting peppery flavor to the uh, to the, the the burger. Actually, very similar to white pepper. It's kind of fun. So you know, make sure you choose some edible flowers as well. See your balcony option. It's a cool spot for the use of pots and containers. You can use anything creative, you know. But you want to make sure you add drain holes to everything that you um, plant inside of, because you don't want to have your your stuff drowned in the long run. Mm -hmm. You need that constant air circulation through that pot too. Those roots need um, air as well. So these are easy to monitor, usually just outside the door, a sliding door. You can look outside and, and watch them from a couch typically. Um, you're limited on your plant selection, depending on what type of light conditions you have. Maybe you're full sun balcony, maybe you're full shade balcony. And it, you know, there's definitely options for both. Um, it, it is the most limited space of all of the options. Um, but it's cool because it can be enjoyed from indoors. You know, you just sit out there and turn it on your TV or, you know, eat dinner and watch your plants grow. It's an easy one to start too. It's good for, I, I rent, so that's good for renters. I can have my little pot. I have like a tomato plant right now in a pot and easy and movable with me. There you go. So yeah, all right, step up from uh, balconies. It's like more of a decks and patios idea, as you can see. The uh, woman on the screen here, is, she's got all kinds of stuff that she's growing in all these different fun raised beds, you know. And those are just good ideas. I mean, it helps too for mobility issues, you know, say you have bad back or bad knees and you don't want to bend over. All these things are good for those options as well. Decks and patios are great because they're easy access for water. You know, it's, like it says, you can just drag the hose on over. Um, another great use for pots and containers as well. You can get super creative on a deck because there's a lot more space. You can use it a little bit bigger. Um, it's good for kids too, about their height. They oh yeah. can get in there. That's good tactile. Yeah, absolutely. And in there as well, you can see some violets growing and some marigolds, two more uh, edible flowers. Um, it makes harvesting quick and easy because like, I've, you know, just inside that door there, she could have her kitchen per se. She could run out there, cut herself some basil for like for a uh, quick pesto like Margaret. <laughs> such she's gonna do. and uh you know you just and there's nothing more fun than that i just made pesto the other day from, from, from some store-bought basil and i usually do pesto from homegrown basil and it was you know it was the it, it tasted different. similar but at the same time i was you know missing my homegrown basil but <laughs> it would just be it'd be really cool to have a spot where you can just walk outside cut a fresh head of broccoli real fast and go inside and, you know and that food that you consume is literally still living you know that the benefit of that to the human body is is amazing a lot of the things that uh we eat nowadays have been dead for you know a week or two and then we we, we consume them so um you could also beets are easy to grow we can you know plant them in the, the spring and fall so you could do uh beet pesto too i love beet yeah, pesto beet pesto is a, a, i love beets beet hummus is a good one for sure <laughs> yeah michigan's you know good for sugar beets too that's a big crop in um our agriculture economy yeah for sure and like uh, it says, you know, if the plants are producing, you can move them around as well, which is uh, uh, cool to have that option because if you plant into the ground, you don't really have the option to plant or to move your plants around. Um, backyard, front yard, similar concept. You know, you can get a little more wild in your backyard than you can your front yard. But if you want to get wild in your front yard too, then have fun. Um, <laughs> front yards becoming super popular these days. I see a lot more uh, front yard gardens that are becoming – um, just the entire lawn, they're taking it and they're making walkways and mini vineyards and trimming fruit trees small and all kinds of stuff. Uh, backyards, it's always been the most popular. It's usually the best choice because of the space, privacy, you know, stuff like that. You can plant directly into the earth, which is my specific uh, favorite method as well. Um, easy access, you can usually get 
a cart or a wheelbarrow, maybe get a vehicle back there. So you don't have to lug all your, your stuff back. Um, you can incorporate fun things into the garden space, such as like trellises, large containers, arbors, benches, logs, yard art, you know, all kinds of stuff. And there's going to be some examples coming up in a little while of fun things. Um, it can be fenced if nature becomes an issue. You can plant nearly anything, you know, based on the growing season that we have. So, um, you know, just weigh out your options. Maybe you have a little bit of everything that you can try out. So, and as you see here, you know, people are all about raised beds and, and stuff like that. The bottom left is more my style of garden. There's real clean edges, like a little six inch trench along the edge kind of helps the grass from impeding the edges of the um of the garden and it allows for like a little debris collection trough for all your leaves and whirly birds and stuff like that and you can clean them out really easily um you know the uh, other options are just for anybody from the bottom right where you see rebar and two by tens you see just above that what's woven sticks which is called a hurdle you can research on how to make hurdles online Above that is just logs that are piled up to make a little raised bed. You know, most of these options are essentially planting in the earth as well. Then you can get super fancy and do a, uh, a pyramidal plant there, you know. But those are those can take uh, a little bit more fine-tuning because they require a lot of water. But, you know, once you understand your, what you're dealing with, you can do anything. Some more fun inspirational. I like that quote just in general. Once you understand what you're dealing with, you can yeah, do I, mean, I yeah. always I always think, you know, like once you truly understand something, that's when you know what you're doing when it comes to it. But yeah, you know, I got the one little photo of the tin cans that have been spray painted pastel colors, but they have holes in the bottom. Uh, you know, that's to show that, you know, I, I'm emphasizing make sure you get holes in the bottom. Even the that shoe, you know, in the middle has the succulents. It has holes in the sides, you know, for ventilation for your feet, but at the same time, those are going to drain. Um, just toy trucks, anything to get kids interested in, you know, like that bike in the bottom right, and it's a little country garden looking. So, you know, whatever suits your uh, interests. More examples of that. I like the boat a lot. I think that's really cute. Yeah, yeah. go to the thrift store when they reopen, yeah. grab whatever. If somebody's handy with a chainsaw, you know, you can make one of these log planters, you know. So it's just options, boots, stumps, old boats, you know, raised trellises, the container garden in the upper right. So, you know, you see old totes and five-gallon buckets and, uh, you know, cat litter buckets and stuff like that. It all works, you know. Or you can get real extreme, like the bottom right. You create a seating space and you know like a little patio and you got stone walkways and and uh cedar uh, post fence and all that kind of stuff you know it looks great no matter what your option is as long as it makes you happy that's the important part so your site preparation um so you want to select your site you know where you're going to go Begin your process of layout, you know, think about how big you want to get, what type of planters you want to get, uh, what the, what's your access. If a lawn site is chose, um, smother your lawn in the fall with cardboard. Dig a, a six inch trench around the bed, like I said, to discourage grass from growing in. You can go back through with your weed whip or uh, pretty much anything, you know, sharp. We use soil knives at work and we just kind of clean up those edges of those beds, you know, and it just kind of trims the grass square again and, you know, collects down in that little trough and you can just grab it up real quick in your hand and dispose of it. So you don't need to use backpack blowers or broom or anything like that. Um, use your compost and topsoil mix. Last week I had done a workshop on, uh, you know, compost 101. And if you make your own compost, you know, good on you. But if you have to buy some, you know, there's no problem at all. You can get compost in a um, bulk delivered from landscape suppliers, or you can get it in, you know, 20 to 40 pound bags from the big box stores or your local garden suppliers and stuff like that. And you're going to want to top dress uh, your gardens yearly with worm casings, uh, compost, or heavily mulched leaves. And I'm talking, you know, heavily mulched, not uh, 
leaves that just raked up or went through the, the mower one time, you're going to want to take, you get like a heavy duty garbage can and take your weed whip and stick it down in there and just weed whip the heck out of those leaves until they're, you know, as, as fine as you can get them and then spread that over your, um, your garden in a one to two inch thick uh, layer and that will decompose quickly over the years. We actually did an experiment where we lay leaves out in about a two thick foot mat to see what would happen with them. And it took about three years, but they've decomposed in this beautiful, um, you know, just compost, just leaf compost, essentially like the, so the soil on the forest floor, but that's undisturbed. We never went and turned them, um, nothing. So it, we tried to smother out a lot of like English ivy in the area of the forest and it worked very, very well. Because we, it was so much of it, we didn't want to use chemical or anything out there, because it could damage so much more than just uh, what we were trying to, what we wanted to kill. So we smothered it in leaves, and now we have a nice planting bed to plant new uh, plants in, and it definitely works well. So is, is English uh, ivy invasive? Is that why we wanted to smother it, or uh, the English ivy? Yeah. So typically, what happens is that um, it's planted in private older estates you know nowadays you don't see much english ivy at newer homes but in older estates it's on houses or big old trees but it creates these little berries that the birds love and they uh, excrete them wherever you know and it spreads really really quickly as a ground cover and then those berries germinate and they drop and then they reseed and then it spreads and so between squirrels birds and just natural germination it can it can take over an area really really quickly so uh yeah you know use that compost and try to do it your, on your own so obviously we have a picture of a packet of seeds here and i bet you know what i'm gonna say so directions. <laughs> i'm always gonna pull up the magic arrow oh there it is <laughs> uh after you've acquired your seeds read the packet see like it says when to sell outside and, and it recommends four to six weeks, you know, when to start inside. Special germination instructions, you know, like these snap peas, soak seeds in water for 12 to 24 hours before sowing. You know, some people go, oh, well, no, duh. Some people go, oh my gosh, that's the greatest thing I've ever learned, you know. <laughs> so it, it just pays to read, you know, tells you when to, how long that you can wait until they'll come up, how deep to plant them, spacing, you know, thinning, all that kind of stuff. So check your packets each packet has details on how to start that specific seed uh you want to follow directions to the you know as best you can i planted like 400 nasturtium seeds the other day and i would say all of my holes you know were fairly close to what the packet read and everything germinated so that's not bad 500 for 500 um most seeds are, are, are pretty easy to sow some stuff out there is you know uh, on an advanced level on what it takes to get it to germinate but overall it's not that big uh not too hard at all <laughs> oh no <laughs> we got a second um, uh, yeah, um, yeah but most things that you would buy for your victory gardens we got a little off subject we tend to do that um but i think it's interesting but um most things that you're gonna buy in those little packets you can still start them now or Either yeah, have to require sure. this um, scarification for fire or anything like that. Although yep. it's really cool. Those are the fun ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Um, you start your seed indoors. Like it says, you know, you want to find a calm space for the germination station. Um, typically, closets, you know, any place that doesn't get, you're not going to have to move everything around all the time. Um, pay attention to how many weeks away last frost is. Certain plants may grow out of control if you start them too early, but as a benefit, starting seeds indoors for other plants like tomatoes and peppers um, is a good thing because you can start them early, get them out there a little more mature, and then get more yield out of your plant a little bit earlier, and, and that hardy plant will last a little bit later in the season as well. So I have a question. So let's say the trajectory is um, our audience right now listens to this this lecture and they're very, very inspired and they go and they start small this year and then they want to start really big next year with indoor seeds. What would be the time frame to start thinking about your indoor seeds? Like typically would it be March? Would it be February? So, well, um, yeah, for gardeners, when the spring cat the seed catalogs start coming out, 
um, like January, everybody starts going crazy. And that's the best time to start looking, uh, you know, at what you want to grow and starting to set up your space. And then, you know, obviously it's to acquire those seeds and look online on those catalogs. You can, it's fun to get the paper catalogs too. A lot of the companies will send them to you. Some of them put a lot of like editorial work into their catalogs. It's more of a book than it is a really a catalog. And, you know, it comes with like glossy, high quality paper instead of like newspaper. So I've always been a fan of ordering just because it's more fun to flip through a book than it is, you know. But double check your orders on the websites that you're, you know, that correspond with the books you may be using because um, the website will give you an active update on like what is in stock. Because when new things hit the market in spring, um, they go quick. So if you see something you want, you know, be bold and, and purchase fast because it's better to spend two ninety nine on some seeds that you didn't end up planting than it is to go the whole summer and being like, oh man, I wish I grew those purple carrots or something. <laughs> so you'd start in January with the, like just kind of perusing looking, starting your plans <laughs> and then um, order, get them around February, start sowing inside around yep. February, March. Yep. I think in February, um, that's my birthday month. So that's kind of what <laughs> I look forward to every year is using my birthday to start acquiring seeds and setting up my, um, you know, wire racks and my lights and my fans and all that stuff this year uh, we did i don't know maybe 200 different plants inside this year which you know took up about four feet by eight feet and uh right. you know it, yeah it was fun like that and the right i always incorporate little photos that send a message and this one is in these seeds are planted in an egg carton a paper egg carton and those are there because you can just plant those directly into the ground you want to bust them up a little bit when you're planting into the ground but it's better to plant it into the ground breaking it up a little bit than it is to just rip the plant out of that because you're doing so much damage to the roots with that little baby seedling so just you know take a pair of scissors or garden pruners and snip those up in the little sections and then plant each one right into the earth it'll decompose extremely quick the, the worms will love you for that um so back to uh what we were saying um so starting seeds indoors, you're going to want to use a potting mix or a seed mix. So all these hydroponic stores popping up around town are like your best friend ever. Those places they have all the nutrients and fertilizers and stuff. And um, you can go in there and tell them like, hey, I'm growing tomatoes. And they're like, this is exactly what you need. Because, you know, more and more and more people are actually doing this stuff uh, every single year, growing it early indoors or just growing their stuff indoors because you can control things. You know, there's not as many insects to worry about indoors as there is outdoors. Yeah. Uh, Higher yield to earlier you start, you know, our, yeah. our springs can be difficult. You so, can see, yeah. I, this is a good one. Um, the eggshells too, like Joe was talking about um, using those and helping out with your worm friends. You want to break these up though, right, Joe, the eggshells. Yeah. Similar to the, uh, you know, the little paper things, you want to crunch them up a little bit. So mm -hmm. like you see here, you got like in the upper left, that's like just a food tray container, but it's cool because it has those little greenhouse dome covers. And for like three bucks at Gordon Food Service, you can get those, you know, and they're like the size of a full sheet tray. Um, you can make little containers out of newspaper. Those biodegrade as well. And it, in these photos, you're going to see pictures of fans and those fans are there for a reason. And that's, you know, you need transpiration to um, get your plants to uptake water. <laughs> And it's the active pass, you know, it's passing of air over the leaves to get the roots to draw up water. And um, having the fans in there do the two, thi do two things. They get the plants to drop water a bit more, and they kind of create rigidity in the stem. Uh, if you take a plant that's not been exposed to, like, you know, the sun or wind, and you take it outside, one of the first things you're going to see is it's going to flop right over, and it'll eventually become rigid. But it'll do that on the ground. So they, it just they get look. soft being indoors all the time. You need to like kind of. Yeah, kind of like humans in the whole COVID experience. <laughs> so we're just like plants. So yeah, um, sowing outdoors. You know, read the packet directions. Like I said before, it be, it's basically how it works. You know, water regularly. Be create, creative as you like. Create rows 
or blocks or swaths. Emily did a real good job of quick clicking to the next slide. To, uh, <laughs> I got excited because it's absolutely gorgeous. <laughs> so yeah, you can go scratch and sprinkle, you know, and just incorporate uh, a bunch of different seeds into the top one inch of, of soil and then start watering them. And, then, and that's literally what you say, you scratch and sprinkle and then see what happens. Yep, you just let, you know, kind of mother nature dictate what's going to germinate the best in what spots and kind of wait to see what comes up. It's kind of fun to do it like that as well. So. Yeah. And here's what I spoiled a little bit, but this is a historic home in Norway, right? Yeah. So uh, you can follow them on Instagram. That's where I found this page. And this is their gardens. These are all vegetables. Um, some of those hedges are like boxwood shrubs, but essentially everything else is all edible stuff. And it's just the idea of what you can do with a little bit of design, some color, and some texture to create, you know, something more than just a, a square box of, of plants. You can do, you know, a little bit of artwork with it, like you see here. Yeah, it's a nice merger between like landscape architecture and design and edible practical, you know, it's like where where form meets function in a lot of ways, which is really cool. So, um, some quick tips here. Uh, study up on tomato and uh, pepper pruning. Um, remove the first few sets of leaves and plant the st stem uh, six inches deep, which is a very interesting thing. I never knew that, but all the potential, all the little hairs on a, a tomato stem are all potential roots. And once those are planted in the soil, they actually become roots. So then you get this little six inch you know, or eight inch plant that's planted six inches deep and if you think about that ratio of you have you know six inches of roots to a two inch plant that's like a plant that is going to be able to survive um, drought better it's going to be able to survive uh, heavy sun better cooler temperatures better just because it has such a heavy duty root system um, already developed and you can do the same thing by uh, laying it on its side and planting it in a little trough and just kind of taking that um, the, the true leaves at the end and turning them up towards the sky and then covering the stem and the roots in, in soil. It will uh, root in the stem and the roots will take and uh, the little, the nodes will start growing up out, you know, towards the sun as well. And um, it's just a tip to help you have more successful tomato plants. Um, tomato topping, that's an interesting one because there's two types of plants, determinate, interdeterminate, and um, I would study up on those terms as well. It's still confusing to me to this day, but um, the, two, the difference between two types of plants essentially are that one sets its fruit all year and one sets its fruit all at once. And knowing when to prune and how to prune those plants just gets you a better yield in the, in the long run. So similar thing with peppers, you know, you can prune them as well. Um, peppers and tomatoes create certain shoots that are just leaves and don't actually ever grow anything on them. So it's kind of like wasted nutrients. You know, they're there for a reason, but um, it's kind well, of stealing the away from the, uh, the fruit as well. So it's kind of uh, more directing the nutrients into the fruit instead of, you know, uh, leaves on the plant. Cause it'll adjust the size and shape of the leaves on the plant that you're leaving to what you're doing. And uh, you're popping some flowers off like the first flowers of the season, I always remove them on peppers and tomatoes and you know, cucumbers, zucchinis, all that stuff, because it uh, just kind of puts it into a state of um, strength building, essentially. So it starts putting out better flowers after you pop all the first ones off. It's just like a response to the stress that of losing all of its flowers. So it's, it says, oh, if that's going to happen, I need to do this. And it, so it just puts on a better flower for you later on feels so mean, but it is one of the best things you can do for your plant is just prune it, cut it back. Um, Kelly's mentioned that a lot, our horticulturist in our rose garden things. You really just kind of have to take them down a little bit. So some more tips for like peas and cucumbers, you know, vines will begin to die if the fruit is let go to seed. So if you want to, if you, you always want to just, you know, follow your vines around from where they come out of the ground to where they go and you know either run your hand up them or just be really watchful with your eye and never let uh, a tomato or a um, 
a cucumber or, or a pea pod go brown or yellow or anything like that because there's a chemical reaction that happens in the plant. Once one goes, the rest go as well, and then the plant kind of dies off. And that's just the way and it is in nature that um, all the fruits, uh, the fruits ripen up, they all hit the ground so that one thing doesn't come through and eat them all at once, you know. They all hit the ground, they decompose real quickly, and then hopefully some of those seeds will germinate naturally. Um, harvest or compost ripening fruit to encourage, you know, uh, future fruiting. So say, you know, you have some cucumbers that you've given your neighbor too many and nobody at work wants them and you can't eat another cucumber for at least another two weeks because you've had 200 already. <laughs> just throw them in your compost pile. There's nothing wrong with that. You're creating, a, you know, that great fertilizer for later on. So uh, um, you don't have to use everything as long as you, you use it in a, a mindful manner. Um, you can use string on a trellis instead of using like sticks and anything with a larger diameter. Uh, the tendrils from cucumbers and peas need a very tiny diameter to wrap themselves around. So things like wire fence works well, uh, strings, you know, all those things work well. You can use old cyclone fence, things like that. Um, successive plantings, sow seeds to get perpetual crops like your leafy greens, your radishes and your carrots. Those pop up in, you know, 30 days. So, as you're seeing them, uh, you're either harvesting them all or they're going to seed. You're going to want to pop those out, you know, or, you know, as they go to seed, pop them out because things are just going to get a little crazy in the garden. But just, you know, as you're seeing your, your lettuce heads start to grow up and they're not so mounded anymore and you see that they get, they're elevating for whatever reason, you know, that's, that's it. It's called bolting. It's going to flower at that point. And you can let it go to flower and harvest seeds off of it um or you can just uh plant some more lettuce around it you know like a week or two before you know you're gonna have to chop it down lettuce is a, a, a tough one because if you let it go too long it produces like a milky white sap that becomes extremely bitter some people like the flavor of it some people don't you know it's all up to you as well um deep water know. you know like once a week i would make sure to uh turn my sprinkler on in the backyard and I leave it on for like four hours and just let it soak that garden deep because the water takes path of least resistance. So when it hits the leaves, it runs down the stems to the stalks, runs down the stalks to the base. It runs down the base to the roots and then out down the roots because it's taking the path of least resistance. There's some amount of like an air pocket along all of those spaces in the soil. So, um, as it's doing that, you know, you're getting deeper and deeper and deeper and it's just going down and down and down. If you see your garden is flooded and everything's floating, then obviously, you know, you've watered too long. But at the same time, um, you know, you always want to want to deep water at least once a week in, in super hot weather. Um, just another one of my, my little personal tips. It just helps uh, create much better plants in the long run. Yeah, you know, the more you garden, the more you understand. Nobody gets up and knows everything about, uh, you know, Gardening in a day, that's for sure. I don't even think anybody that's gardened their entire life knows everything about gardening. Um, gardens are definitely up to Mother Nature. Sometimes things don't work out and don't, you know, beat yourself up or over it. Sometimes we don't think of things. Sometimes we don't expect things, you know. Hailstorms will take your garden out, and there's nothing to really do about that. If you try to protect it from hail, you know, aside from putting it in a greenhouse, there's not much you can do from that. A deer shows up and browses your entire garden in a night. You know, the next, what do you do next year? Put a fence up, you know. It's not that, you don't, it just doesn't require as much, you know, mental taxation as, as some people give it. So, uh, study on companion planting. Obviously, if you've ever heard of this, it's the certain plants benefit from growing next to each other. Um, so that's a fun one to design your garden around that as well. Use the no-till method. So search for YouTube for Charles Doubting No-Till. Uh, aside from from his uh, videos, he's got a uh, amazing, calming voice, you know, and a very fun accent. They, you know, I personally can listen to him for hours on end and just download all of the information that he uh, that he has to say. He's all organic. He does no till. Um, he's a compost fanatic. You know, he's really interesting. You can learn a lot from him. So check it out, um, and definitely add calcium. Calcium is one of the um, 
major ones because we have a huge calcium deficiency in this, you know, in Metro Detroit. Um, calcium helps fight powdery mildew on squash uh, and, you know, and cucumber plants. Um, so typically when that shows up, even on lilac and things like that, powdery mildew is there because the plant doesn't have the ability to take up calcium or calcium is not in the soil for the plant to take it up. Therefore, um, you have to put it, you know, a soluble version of calcium in the, in the soil. So once again, you know, check online, check uh, big box stores. There's so many different brand names of soluble calcium out there that uh, um, they all work. You know, when I, I don't recommend very often is miracle Grow, but miracle Grow is exactly what the name is, is a miracle because it offers all, not, one type of a nutrient, but every single type of nutrients, and it makes them all immediately available. Some nutrients go into the soil, they have to go through a process of mineralization and all that stuff to become uh, soluble, then to be taken up by the plants. But this stuff, as soon as you put it in water, it's good to go, and it doesn't just give you your, your NPK, your nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. It gives you all the micronutrients on top of that, you know, which is, there's just too many to name. So um, I personally don't uh, use Miracle Grow in my garden, but I know people who do, and their plants look good. I think it's more for like potted plants and things like that, you know. So, but to each their own. Do whatever you want in your in your space as long as it makes you happy. So yeah. So you can buy calcium additives, but then you can also use to a smaller scale, I'm sure, um, eggshells and calcium-rich compost. Correct. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. You know, the more eggshells and, and that's one of those ones where eggshells need to be broken down into a soluble state. So through composting and microbes in the soil, they can be broken down into a soluble state and then taken up by the plants. But as you saw earlier in the, um, the photo, there was a, um, um, an eggshell plant there. And that is not soluble right away. So, so yeah, those are not soluble right away. It'll take a little bit of time to um, break those down, you know, a year or two to get those to become nothing again. So, you know, one of my tips in my compost, that if you do compost eggshells, let them dry out in the air and then put them in a blender or something and powderize the living heck out of them because the more powder-like they are, the faster they'll decompose. So, a little recap, you know, started with Victory Gardens in World oh, yeah. War One, and they became super popular in World War Two. You have something to say? Yeah, they helped us uh, win the war. They're good. Um, and then another recap, there's a, a potential third wave. It's kind of yet to be defined as we're living in it. Um, but it is a great time to have a Victory Garden for sustainability um, and connecting to the earth that we don't really have um, or it's hard to find. So now is a great time to really think about your victory garden and thinking about actionable things we can do um, in this time of uncertainty, I think is really nice. Yep, absolutely. You know, so if you do want to start your own victory garden, you know, these are your steps right here. You're finding your seeds and that's one of the fun ones. If you get a copy of this and go back and look at the links and stuff and go to those websites, see, I'll say, seed savers exchange again that's seed savers exchange check them out i do not get sponsored by them at all but <laughs> I definitely them and every one of my you know abilities to do so i love their what they stand for and uh, just to, you know they employ some really intelligent people that are in this world to do good and I'm here to support something like that. So yeah, that's the one that's kind of community driven where I could give like my, I actually do have my grandma's rhubarb, my great grandma's rhubarb. Um, so I could give that, yeah. I got it to seed and then you get the store. Like, you know, this was the Hoffman family rhubarb. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. And that yeah. company's cool because they'll test your seeds for you because they don't want to sell false product and they'll let you know that like, Oh, actually, you know, this was cross contaminated with another plant, you know? So, say your neighbor grew GMO corn and you're growing grandma's corn, that will actually cross contaminate because corn is windblown pollinated. So uh, it's an, it's just an interesting one. That, they have uh, good resources too, especially for your first time gardeners. Um, yeah. 
a lot yeah. of good resources, a lot of citizen science um, programs that you can go do through them. They, they are a, Seed Savers Exchange is a fantastic website to check out. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, you know, just site selection, site prep, all that stuff. Study up, do some yeah. Google searches, hit up YouTube. You just know. try it, too. What's yeah. going to What's the worst that can happen? <laughs> the worst thing that you can happen is you grow some plants. Yeah, and yeah, that's true. Or they all die, that's okay. Yeah, yeah it's, it's okay. Well, we'd like to open up the questions if anybody has anything. Sure. Um, I think what I'm going to do is uh, now pause the recording uh, so that uh, the people who are attending can ask questions. And we so appreciate you coming today. Mm -hmm.